Do you believe that entrepreneurship can solve all the problems in the world? I do, That's with the definition market. with the definition I gave you. With that definition. You're known as the entrepreneur philosopher, and you're postulating that the journey from reason to profits is the new business model that we should be in. And I'm going to put it right out here, right off the bat, is you're saying that the leaders, that's the executive team, for example, cannot control profits and income. Is that right? That is exactly what I'm saying. There are five pillars in the organization. There is the customer, the employee, the partners that work with you, the investors, and sometimes the investor may be you, your wife, your dad. You have investors and you have the society. There's an exchange also with the society. There's a give and take. And if you violate those, if you break those, those relationships, those exchange parameters, something is not working in your company. Um, I teach business. And I'm telling you what we've been taught in the MBA schools. I teach at an MBA school. <laughs> One of the top, one of the top ones in the country. What we have been taught in business schools is false. It, good companies always work when they have these battles, and I can give you many, many examples. Can you tell me who is an entrepreneur? Let me ask you. Is the objective of entrepreneur to make money? No, that's a byproduct. My friend, I've asked this question from many people. You're probably one of the few who has answered it correctly. Is that one of the things that, or well, perhaps the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make in business? They think it's all about money, all about making My opinion, money. and that's exactly why people are afraid of the AI, because we think it's replacing our core competency. Our core competency is not processing information. It's using the processed information to be creative, innovative, to build. And make decisions. To find different problems. Make decisions that solve bigger things. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we're joined by Sid Mohaseb. Sid, how are you doing? I'm excellent. Glad to be here with you. Where are you speaking with us from? It looks really bright and sunny where you are. Los Angeles. Oh, you're in Los Angeles. Oh, you're enjoying the Lakers this time of year. <laughs> you had to push it, huh? No, but it's, it's quite interesting <laughs> because a lot of those games, if you realize what's happening, and it's going to tie back into business, they had the lead. They had a strong I lead. Don't, I can't and, explain it. I, you know, it's uh, the advertising money, I think, is significant. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm glad to have you on today because you you have something to share with us that I think is quite interesting, a little bit controversial, not in the sense of, oh, let's bird out the village kind of controversial, but controversial in the sense that I never looked at it that way. And you're saying, and I'm going to put it right out there, right off the bat, is you're saying that the leaders, that's the executive team, for example, cannot control profits and income. Is that right? That is exactly what I'm saying. You're known as the entrepreneur philosopher, and you're postulating that the journey from reason to profits is the new business model that we should be looking at. Now, you're very accredited in everything that you've done. You've been adjunct professor of several major universities in California, and you've not only been in business, you've been in entrepreneurship, you've been in investment, you've been in engineering, you have been in venture capital, you have a successful career. So here's the million dollar question right off the bat. What exactly do you mean that the leaders can influence profit? Where is that coming from? So uh, influence is different than control. So uh, we're all influencing each other in one way or another, uh, but we're not controlling. Uh, here's, here's, let, me, let me start off by asking you a question. Please. Who do you think... Who do you think makes the decision to buy? The sales guy or the buyer? The buyer. So the sales guy has no control over your decision except saying, here's what I got. Yes. Based on what's on your mind, you use your reasoning. You have a why. You have a cause. You have a reason to make mm -hmm. a purchase. So the control of my revenue is really in your hands as the consumer. Yes. 
I don't have any control. I can just say, here's the value I'm delivering to you. Mm -hmm. And then you process that. And there is an exchange relationship. You say, I'm going to give you my money in mm -hmm. return for what you're giving me. And that is a good deal, a good relationship, a good exchange for me. Okay. Now, the same thing happens. And, you know, a lot of people focus on customers only. But mm -hmm. that's, you know, customers may be the king, but no king can make uh, millions of people happy without them participating or desiring to be happy. Yes, true. So let's look at it from a different perspective. You think you'd give somebody a job, mm -hmm. but in reality, they accept that job. And in their own mind, they have a reason. They say, hmm, my kids are sick. I need a benefit package or I'm young, or this, uh, you pay me 50 bucks an hour. I'm really $75 an hour worth. That's who I am. But, mm -hmm. you know, I need the money. I need to pay the rent. Yeah. So you decide that you're going to bring in your best to the game. Mm -hmm. You decide if you're going to be 100% productive. You decide as the employee that you want to be working or thinking or being creative at 3 o'clock in the morning about the company. Or you decide to be hey, I check off at five because that's what I signed up for. Mm -hmm. And you, my friend, as the employer, have no control, no control over that reasoning or decision. Okay. The same thing Wait. is with your, pro with your partners. The partners, your supply chain partners, have the same argument. They're people. They have some reasons. The reason that they work with you is, is very different. And if you're looking for money, the investors have a similar kind of a structure. There are five pillars in the organization. There is the customer, the employee, the partners okay. that work with you, the investors, and sometimes the investor may be you, your wife, your dad. Sure. Mm -hmm. You have investors and you have the society. Mm -hmm. There's an exchange also with the society. It's a give and take. And if you violate those, if you break those, those relationships, those exchange parameters, Something is now working in your company. Now, in order to prosper, all of these five, which are always in, in, in flux, by the way, the customers that you think you had 20 years ago, even last year, are not the same people that you have now. Yeah. The employees of three, four, five years ago, before COVID, are not the same people that you are employing today. They have different reasonings. They have different needs. They have different expectations. These are always, these five pillars are always changing. So your job as a leader is not to control the profits or the revenue because they're an outcome. Okay. If you provide the right reason to your employee, your employee would be productive. Sure. Not because of you, because of them. The customers would buy because they see the right exchange. Not because of you, because of them. The partners would do whatever they can to make you successful because of them. So if you are able to what I call harmonize, and this is not a balance. This is the same thing people talk about work-life balance. It's nonsense. <laughs> it's, it's just nonsense. Life is not in equal amounts. We blend together. We harmonize it. Don't balance it. It's like a symphony, a symphony that has ebbs and flows. It's not like in a music piece you say, hey, We've got 10 minutes for the drum. We have exactly 10 minutes for the guitar, 10 minutes for the saxophone. That doesn't work. It's all blending together. That's what harmony means. Mm -hmm. So I propose that a good business yeah. must work based on the reasons and a good leader must be a harmonizer, like a mm -hmm. symphony, an orchestra conductor who realizes the changes and there's a give and take, and sometimes these things are in conflict. I can give my employees a lot of money, but I can't satisfy my investor. I can do make these two happy, compromise on the quality of the product I give my customer. I can push my partners to take less, but then they're going to compromise my quality. They're going to compromise my uh, payment. They're going to compromise something in I their return, it. in their exchange. So everything else is affected. So... It's a system of harmony that needs to be managed, that needs to be led, and nothing is in balance ever. 
And those things are based on the reasons that drives the profits. Does that make sense? Yeah, that, that, that sounds beautiful to be the reasons part of the exchange. And even in general economic terms, just basic economics, when you look at supply and demand, it's, I believe what you're saying is another way of looking at it because demand and supply doesn't meet at equilibrium unless there is a good enough exchange of values on both parts. The price the demander is asking for is quiet enough to match what the value is in terms of what the supplier is given. So let's, well, let's, I, let's look at this. Let's talk about demand and supply. Okay. If I have cancer and you, my friend, have the cure for cancer, okay. I will sell my house. To get that cure. To get that cure. But if I yeah. don't have that cancer, that has no value to me. doesn't matter how good of a salesman you are. doesn't matter. You know, people think that uh, salespeople have to be a, a bullshit. There's a gift of a gab. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a false, it's a false, false narrative. narrative that's been pushed upon us. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is that, you know, everybody is thinking about, oh, it's revenue, profit, revenue, profit, revenue, profit. I'm not against, I mean, you mentioned it. I've had four or five companies that I've built. I advise Fortune 500 company, you know, CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, I teach business. And I'm telling you what we've been taught in the MBA schools. I teach at an MBA school. <laughs> One of the top, one of the top ones in the country. What we have been taught in business schools is false. It good companies always work when they have these balance. And I can give you many, many examples. Many examples. You know, uh, I want to ask before you give the example, because you spoke about the harmony, and you mentioned that you won't necessarily have four minutes of drums, then two minutes of guitars, and then some sax. Everything is in harmony. But you mentioned very critically that it's not a 50-50 equal exchange, work-life balance. That's rubbish. So here's where my question comes in before I give the example. Which pillars weigh heavier in this harmony and why? I have an answer in my mind, but I want to see if I'm right. So I'm going to you ask would think question. You would think it would be the customer. Actually, no. I think it depends on what the... Um, that's exactly what it is. And music doesn't have one thing that plays all the time. It depends. Mm -hmm. It depends. It depends. And the job of a leader is to understand the ebbs and the flows. Mm -hmm. It depends on the I energy that needs to be well. created. It depends on the, on the needs of the market. It depends on the needs of the customer, the needs of the employee. It depends on the time. It depends on the relationship and the exchange. It depends. And it's, again, and it's always changing. For example, 10 years ago, people weren't demanding to be working from home. Yes. Now they do. Five years ago, they wouldn't do that. Now they do. Uh -huh. Right? Uh, three years ago, uh, an investor would have been happy with the 5% return on investment. Now they won't. Right? Uh -huh. It's different. And you've got to remember this. This, when I say that the, the pack, the, the exchange is based on a bundle of satisfaction, a collection of things. Everybody thinks it's money. It's, it's not. not. Money. You know, let's, let's look at buying cars. When you buy a car, any car, you don't buy a means of transportation. You buy status. You buy efficiency. Sometimes it's uh, status. Great. Somebody wants to uh, look good for girls and buys a Ferrari. <laughs> somebody, somebody has kids and buys a van, and you know that that's uh, you know that, that that can take the kids to the soccer game. Somebody buys a Volvo because it's safe. Somebody buys a Toyota because it's economical. Somebody buys a Mercedes because whatever. But nobody, nobody buys a means of transportation. This doesn't mean that the car should not be a means of transportation. You could buy a ten dollar bag, a purse, and put the phone, and the keys in it. Or you could buy a Louis Vuitton for $5,000. The functionality is the same. The reason is different. And that's where we get into um, market segmentation and um, differentiating your ideal customers and stuff like that. Because yeah. you're not selling based on... Somebody said something quite interesting. Um, Glenn Rudin is said that we always think that new is best. New is not best because we've lived so long without the new. Chances are we can go a little bit further without the new. You need to ensure that what you're bringing to the market is actually solving a problem in a, meaning, in a meaningful way 
that customers are willing to part money with. And I think that's what you're saying here. It's not the functionality, because when you look at even new cell phones, new smartphones these days, it's pretty much the same thing. You can make a call on the phone, but now it does a little bit more. But there's also a status that's attached to certain phones like the iPhone versus having one from China, right? So that is also a part of it. That's so it's that what I call, that's what I call the bundle of satisfaction, okay? Ah. So I may buy an iPhone because... And I, I feel, oh, this is more expensive, therefore I'm more, I'm more, uh, you know, important, or uh, because uh, you have a, uh, my, because my husband, my wife, my friends have an iPhone, and now I'm in a thing, and I can do a FaceTime, or I could do this or that. Uh, th there's because my laptop is is also a, a, an Apple, or because of a number of different reasons. It's not necessarily based on functionality, but some people. Here's the thing. Let me let me let's let's reverse this. You buy an iPhone maybe for fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. What if I make that three thousand dollars? Would you still buy an iPhone? And that depends, doesn't it? It depends on how much I value the iPhone now versus okay. a substitute. So let's say you do. Let's say I make it ten thousand dollars. If it brings enough value, I'll have to go with uh, it, right? There is a there is a time where that exchange begins to break. Okay. Now Part of the reason that people would pay that fifteen hundred to three thousand is your iCloud pictures, mm -hmm. because all of your memories about graduations and kids getting, uh, uh, you know, the first day, it's the last day, it's the all of that is on your I'm iCloud. Sure and stuff. if I want to get that, I have to take all of that, and there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. So it's not just what the functionality is or how it looks good. There's all sorts of other things. That comes into play. The ecosystem. Now, that's the bundle of satisfaction. That is the exchange. The exchange is not I'm giving you an iPhone, you're giving me a dollar or two or fifteen hundred dollars. Question. You're familiar with the launch of iTunes, right? Yeah. iTunes back in the early two thousands. And before that we had like Na Napster and LimeWire and Aries Donor, like these illegal sites. I've read in several books about business strategy that one of the reasons why Apple became such a behemoth, as you would call it, is because unbeknownst to most, like the general um, onlooker, the iPod, which came before the iPhone, was just like a loss leader for them, right? It was just an entry into the ecosystem that is Apple, because when you get the iPod, you get iTunes. And iTunes, as they put it back then, was a thousand songs in your pocket. You know, you have the iPhone and the iPad and the Mac. All so let's, 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 unbundle, let's unbundle that because it's a good example. So mm -hmm. there was something called a, a Walkman. You're probably too young to remember. Oh, no, I know the Walkman with the cassette player and the buttons on top, the radio Correct. buttons on top. Oh, yeah. Sony <laughs> came out with the Walkman where you would take your cassette player, you would have a headset, and you would listen to music. It was... Yeah. An extremely, extremely, extremely successful play. They made millions and millions and hundreds of millions of dollars from it. So, what what iPad actually, what 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 the iPod actually did was a copy of that same idea. The idea was the same. The idea was people like to listen to music. Can I give it to them in a different way? And the idea was for a recurring income, because if you get it once, now I can make money from you multiple times. Yeah. Sony didn't have the recurring income element to it. Now, when, when they came out, it was the same price, $400, $500. You could get iPods. Here's the thing. The idea of iPod, I have purchased one at the same time in Hong Kong for $3. Yeah. It existed. Mm -hmm. It wasn't new. But the whole idea of the iTunes and the, and the serviceability and upgrading and coverage and all that, that was new. Ah. Okay. That was new. So the brilliance of it, you mentioned, is, is not necessarily that it's a new thing. You know, it's just packaged differently that addresses a bundle of satisfaction that addresses a bundle of satisfaction. They had the problem. The pain was identified that people like to listen to music 
and they like to be mobile in listening to music. It's how do you satisfy that 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 element and urge or desire. So uh, you know, again, you'll say new is not always better. Mm-hmm. True, but th- there is there is an element of change versus new, and I want to talk about that for a minute if you let me. Mm-hmm. Change is your only friend my, my, that 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 gives you that gives you options. It gives you, nobody else, nothing else in the world gives you options. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nobody, except change. Change says, if this is the state, and then when it becomes this state, now you have three options, you choose. It's the most powerful tool in your decision-making, change. Now, change doesn't mean that it shouldn't be going back to something we existed. Change doesn't mean that something wasn't good and we shouldn't use it. Change says, it's giving you an option. You know, you go from work to home, every day you take the same road, you take the same path, you walk the same way. The road is there. It's always been there. You can make a right turn as opposed to a left turn. And guess what? It's going to give you some other choices. Mm-hmm. Maybe the traffic is less. Maybe you see the one that you've always wanted to fall in love with along the way. Maybe you find a place with a sandwich that's better. It gives you other options. But it doesn't mean that it didn't exist before. It just means that you saw it now. You have to see it. Mm-hmm. You, as the entrepreneur, have to see what exists out there, and that means that you have the power of, of then choice. And that does not come unless you change. Do something different. Um, Einstein was saying that if you do the same thing over and over and you expect different results, you know, that's, that's a madman right there. It's a madman. And, <laughs> and you know, we do it, my friend. We, we don't like change. Because so are we all, so all, all madmen? <laughs> Is because we're lazy. So we like what's comfortable. We like what's reliable. We like what's sure to give us some result instead of venturing out into unknown waters for bigger catch. And that's you a know? fool's game. Now, that's the, you said that they call me the entrepreneur philosopher. Yeah. Here's the thing. They have sold you that idea. Mm-hmm. They have sold us the idea that if we conform to this, this is better for us than venturing into something new. That's not true. It's true. If You're that right. was the case, humanity would have been the same way it was 10,000 years ago and we'll be running in the wild chasing, uh, you know, uh, chasing boars and chasing uh, deers and, uh, you know, and having them, uh, you know, eating them, <laughs> eating them with our bare hand and bare teeth. That's not the case. It does take a little bit of a, uh, call it guts, call it courage, call it trust in ourselves that sameness the thing that we think it's comfortable it's actually a poison comfort is good but comfort is not good comfort is a state of mind so when you embrace and even make change and be comfortable with making that then you're comfortable what we've been sold is that if you make a change if you move then you're not comfortable my friend and because you're not comfortable you should stay where it is you should stay where you are and i don't think that is the right thing to do. You're either growing or you're dying. If you're staying the same, then you're actually dying. I don't remember who it is that said that. <laughs> um, I think it was Alex or Mosey. Because you have to remember, um, even though you think you're staying the same, everything around you is moving forward. So you're actually yep. getting left behind in the bigger picture of things. That's right. So my, my first book, um, I have a few books. I, my first book's title mm-hmm. is the ca- ga- uh, Gaining the Caterpillar's Edge. You know, the caterpillar evolves and evolves again, butterfly. evolves and evolves again until it becomes a butterfly. Yeah. Now, notice, a caterpillar is an entirely a different species who cannot fly where a butterfly can. Yeah. So it becomes a different species. Mm-hmm. And it doesn't happen overnight. Over time. It takes time. Constant change. It takes time. It, it's a constant change. And all of a sudden, voila, you're a butterfly. <laughs> But it doesn't happen like that. We, we have been trained to look at how-tos to do things. How do I go do this? But life is not going to Ikea or some, you know, some place where you buy pieces of things and you know, put A to B and B to C and voila, you have, you have something. That's not life. And that certainly is not entrepreneurship. Wow. Now, 
Certain things are important. Yeah, you should learn how to market. You should learn how to do accounting. You should learn, you know, uh, how to do certain things. But, uh, but that's not life. Those are the mechanics of things. The fact that you know how to put your shoes on. Somebody teaches you how to not, you know, tie the shoelaces. That doesn't make you a runner. It just, you just know how to put the shoes on. The myth that's like learning how to do marketing. That doesn't make you an entrepreneur. <laughs> It's just a small part of the whole pie. It's, and the rest of it is up to you. You're the runner. It's in your mind. Uh-huh. It's how you practice. It's how you get ready. It's how you eat, how you act, how you feel. And that's come from all of us separately. The second book that I have is called You Are Not Them. You're now 10? You are not them. You are not them. Ah, great. You are not them. You're not Elon Musk. You're not Jeff Bezos. Neither yeah, am I. Married. Neither am I. We, we are not them. And that's perfectly fine. <laughs> and that's what gives us the power. Mm-hmm. We're not them because every one of us have a different upbringing, parents that are different, financial situations that are different, IQs that are different. If we have a Sorry. business, the people that work with us are different. Our customers are different. Our employees are different. What we sell is different. Everything is different. Everything is different. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so the mechanical things, yeah, you can learn. But in order to win, you have to be authentic. You have to learn how to build an ecosystem and act like an ocean. How to realize the timing of change, be like a dancer. Mm-hmm. How to navigate risk. You no, know, entrepreneurs are not risk takers. <laughs> They're risk navigators. They just know how to risk, navigate risk. Mm-hmm. They're like a pilot. You have a commercial pilot. Everything is the same every day. You know, thousands and thousands of planes get up and land every day. They do the same thing. Engine check, oil check, gas check, electrical check. Those are checking the risks. Mm -hmm. An entrepreneur has all of those just like a pilot. But then you have people shooting at you and you have limited gas, limited money. You have limited, you have to navigate those risks Mm -hmm. like a pilot. And, and, and every battle is different. And every battle is different. And if you're doing that as you're harmonizing again, you can win. You don't need to be Elon Musk. Now, here's the other thing that I want to, I want to share with you. You know, they say, can you tell me who is an entrepreneur? Let me ask you. In my opinion, who is an entrepreneur? Yeah, who is an entrepreneur? Let me think and give you a very good answer that comes to mind. An entrepreneur is a person who looks at society, they see a need, and they come up with a solution, whether unique or novel, to solve that solution and bring some service or goodwill to their community. And they do so by undertaking all the necessary risks and preparation to bring that vision to life over is, the years. Is the objective of entrepreneur to make money? No, that's a byproduct. My friend... I've asked this question from many people. You're probably one of the few who has answered it correctly. Really? An entrepreneur, the definition of an entrepreneur in the, in the 1700s, that's how the definition was developed. It's mm-hmm. someone who has something, mm-hmm. someone who has something. It could be an idea, it could be a product, it could be his time, who is exchanging it with something of higher value. So I have something, I want to exchange that with something of higher value. And then that definition was altered by, a, uh, by an Irishman 50 years or so later in the mid-1700s. He says, an entrepreneur is somebody who has something, who was to exchange it with something of higher value, knowing that there is risk. Ah, so he added risk. He added risk. He says, I do want to change this with higher value, but there is a risk that it doesn't happen, that it, it may not happen. Yeah. Right? Now, with that definition, think about every student in every college. Mm-hmm. They have something. It's their time, their parents' money, <laughs> their, their <laughs> efforts, staying up all late at night, paying the school. Mm-hmm. Why do they do that? Because they think. They think. They hope mm-hmm. that they can exchange all of that with a better life, something yeah. of higher value. But yeah. there is a risk. The fact that you have a degree doesn't guarantee your success. Mm-hmm. So are they entrepreneurs? You bet they are. So if with that definition, if you look at it, what Martin Luther King is an entrepreneur, 
Mother Teresa was an entrepreneur. They had something and they want to exchange it with something better. You have the choice to decide what you want to exchange your ideas, time, effort, creativity with. It's your choice. We're all entrepreneurs. The question is, what do we choose to exchange what we have with? And there's always a risk that it may or may not work. And you have to manage that risk. You have to navigate navigate that navigate that risk. Managing means controlling. Navigating means getting through it. You're navigating the risk. Is that one of the things that, or well, perhaps the biggest mistake that entrepreneurs make in business? They think it's all about money, all about. Making My opinion, money. because that's the way the society has defined it for us. Just like the MBA thing, they said it's all about making the revenue and the profit. So people, people are focused on that. You know, what gets measured gets done. People are focused on yeah. that thing. They're not focused on how the machinery works. It's like a car engine. It's not just about the fuel you put it in. There's a lot of mechanical things that happens with the engine to work. If, we, if I just say, oh, better fuel, better engine, better fuel, better, it doesn't work. The mechanical pieces that work in a business are based on those five pillars. They have always been based on those five pillars. I'm not, I'm not a genius who threw this out from, you know, I, I didn't sit one day and God came to me and said, hey, he said there's this five. No, it's always been there. What we have done is we have forgotten about it. Good companies are all already doing it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get out of harmony. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you get messed up. Yeah. Sometimes the music gets broken. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you know, you're out of tune. You know, the reason I believe we are where we are in terms of entrepreneurship, I think it's, I think it's part because we glamorize the end results so much and we, we don't appreciate the journey, right? Because if you look at Elon Musk, huge success today. Many people know about him. But I remember one person tweeted him a few years back and asked him about his success. And they said to him that, what did it take for him to get to where he was? And he replied that it took years of disappointment and sadness, a lot of hard work. But then he added that nobody wanted to hear about that. And if we look at social media, if I, let's say I have this interview with this wonderful gentleman, Sid, this morning, and I go to the interview, I make a terrible mistake, I offend you, you get upset, and you storm off the interview, and the interview goes... No, you get, a lot, you get a lot more views. <laughs> no, but here's the thing, though, because people love controversy, but no one is going to look at it that look at him, he's trying. It's a controversy there, therefore. But if I get on this interview, you say, oh, yes, and we have a wonderful interview. Nobody no. cares. All right. And that's now, the thing. <laughs> yeah, Please, I, I, I write a lot of articles. You know, I write yeah. for Forbes. I write for Time Magazine, for USA Today, Independent, Foreign Policy, all, all sorts of places. So one morning, I had an article in The Hill. You know, Hill is in the Washington's uh, main main uh, yeah. publication. It's a pretty, you know, pretty, pretty decent, uh, respectable place. And um, I get an email, uh, you know, one of these Google alerts that, uh, you know, your name has shown up somewhere. Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, it's about six o'clock in the morning. I click on it. Oh, yeah, my, my article is published on, on the Hill. I click on it. It was published about an hour before. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. There was 357 comments on it in that one hour. Wow. I said, wow, right. look at me. What did I say? <laughs> <laughs> right. People care about my thoughts. So I clicked on it and I looked at the comments. Mm -hmm. Only two people, only two, had yeah. read the article. Wow. The rest of them were commenting on the, the heading. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which, which, by the way, wasn't in my control. You know, when you publish something as an opinion piece, it's the editor that changes yeah. the heading to the way that they like it. So I wasn't right? even in control of the heading. Some yeah. editor, chief editor of the Hill, changed the heading, put a heading there, and there was 357 comments, and 355 of them have not read the article. Yeah, that's the society. That's the, that's 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 what it is. That's a fact. People are not interested. They're interested in the headings. Mm -hmm. 
That's what we have trained them to be interested in the headings. Mm -hmm. And that's why you have to have um, clickbait um, titles and stuff like that's that. That's what they make. That's how they make money. By those well, you, know, you know, I think this is also a growing problem. You're familiar, are you familiar with um, how the brain works in a psychological terms? And what I mean in by a, that in is, a little bit, I'm not an expert in it, but uh, a little you bit. Know enough. Essentially, what happens is that it's because children are spending so much time now on social media which is geared towards keeping them on the platform. But here's the thing, what the attention engineers do when it comes to social media. It's not about keeping you on one thing. It's keeping you on a multitude of things. So we're overloaded these days which too, with too much information. The brain was never made to get in so much information. I want to bring up, um, I think this is a trigger word, but it's a blurred out, but pornography, for example. Today, young men have access to more naked women in five minutes than a hundred years ago men had in their entire lifetime. But that's not how the brain was made to work. So when you overload the brain with so much information, it's set on turbo, on overdrive, just to sift through everything and find the most critical information, the buzzwords, the trigger words, something that is controversial or something that emits a strong emotion. And they would have to talk about dopamine and what that does. So now, unless something promises for example, how to become rich in one month or how to become a millionaire in one year. Unless it's something sensational like that that removes the long journey to get into where you need to be and gives you immediate gratification because that's what we're on to now. We're not on delayed gratification anymore. Nobody wants to get into that. Nobody wants to take the time to read a 1,200-word blog post to figure out what this person is trying to say, understand where they're coming from, and then make an informed comment. That is true, but... but uh... We can also look at it a different way. So you're absolutely right. Uh, in a sense that we've been trained, uh, there's too much information. We look at something that's controversial or, or, or the mind doesn't quite uh, get. We form decisions fairly quickly. Uh, we don't necessarily listen to hear, to learn. We listen to reply. We listen to act, mm -hmm. uh, which, is, which is a problem, uh, which is a big problem. Now, let's look at this from a different angle, though. Our brain was, is not today capable of processing so much information, and therefore this behavior comes. But our brain is not necessarily, if you look at the humanity or evolution, is capable of doing a lot more <laughs> if that information is provided in a structured manner to it. And that's what the AI can come in. AI is a processing unit that you can imagine is next to our brain that processes lots of intelligence, lots of information, and is able to give us contained, structured outcomes that we can make a decision on faster. So if you really look at it, our brains have been limited because the processing of information is what taxes it, what, what, what contains 80%, 90% of processing power is in processing. 80, 90% of its power of our brain is in the processing of information. Where we have to, and I think this is a revolution, and again, this is one of those things that, you know, you'll say, why do they call me an art a philosopher? Is because I believe that not tomorrow, not in my lifetime, in the next 100 years or so, we'll be able to shift and learn that there is more that we can do as humanity and the path of evolution than just processing information. It's creativity and innovation and ability to use this processed information and not be bogged down that our mind should only process information. So we give the processing to the computers and use the processing power to do something more creative. It's not, imagine you have a calculator. You don't need to do all the... It, that doesn't, a calculator doesn't make you dumber. No, it doesn't make you a better accountant either. It doesn't make you a better accountant. It just makes you do some physical thing faster. And that's okay. And There's nothing it. wrong with it. So I shouldn't use a, use a calculator... And, and stay there for 27 hours and, and, and add and delete this because uh, I think that uh, that's my purpose. job. That's not my job. Mm -hmm. your, your job is to make sense of the output of the calculator. 
And that's exactly why people are afraid of the AI because we think it's replacing our core competency. Our core competency is not processing information. It's using the processed information to be creative, innovative, to build. And make decisions. To find different problems. Make decisions that solve bigger things. Do you believe that entrepreneurship can solve all the problems in the world? I do, That's with the definition with the definition I gave you. With that definition. With the definition so, I gave you. That we all have something and if we begin and, and we are every day. You know, people ask me, how do how do how do I know I'm an entrepreneur? How do I practice? How do I get to where you get? I said, start tomorrow morning, start this afternoon. When you go out to get buy milk or take the kids off the, uh, from school, don't go the same route. Turn right as opposed to left. Stop. Listen to music. Change the channel. Realize that you have choice. Yes. Now, it may be a small choice. You'll say, oh, but first you have to realize you have choice. Then you have to realize that change is your friend and it's giving you options to act. Then you have to realize you are indeed exchanging what you have with something different. You have the time, stop, enjoy the sun, enjoy something. Mm -hmm. Spend two more minutes, ten more minutes with the ones that you love. Spend ten more minutes on some idea you want to develop. It's your choice. When you begin to realize that you have something, and you don't have to necessarily be Elon Musk, you have something, and you're exchanging that something with something better. And as you do that, and you realize that you actually can, that you are a player, that you can play the music, that you're an excellent runner, you're Olympic quality winner, mm -hmm. then you begin to exercise. And if you do that, if we all do that, if we all exchange what we have with something better, we'll have a phenomenal, phenomenal life. Beautiful. How did you get into entrepreneurship? So I've thought about this actually quite a bit. <laughs> Um, uh, and I've come to a conclusion that uh, based on the same thing that I'm saying, I'm, uh, I was saying that it's an exchange uh, idea, that I was trying to exchange what I have with something better. I'm an immigrant from Iran. Uh, I was 16 years old when I came to the United States by myself. Uh -huh. And it has a story of how I came and all that. But when I look at it, I, I've come to the conclusion that it's not me, but all immigrants are entrepreneurs. Because yeah. they wanted to exchange what they had with something better, knowing that there was a risk. They knew <laughs> that there was a risk. And every one of them, every one of them tries to exchange what they have, where they live, what they do, with something better. And that's why they immigrate. That's why they move. So uh, when... And, and then I've built a number of companies. The first one, I was in college and, and, and so forth. But... What I have learned, and if you look at my, my history, I'm not a one, one company, one guy, one situation kind of. I like the change. Today, I advise many companies, and I like the fact that from beginning to end of the day, I have seven things to deal with. And they're all different, and they all have different problems and different issues. That keeps me creative. That keeps me going all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's what what do you have and what do you exchange it with? And that makes you an entrepreneur. Now, have I at times exchanged my time and efforts with money? Yes, I have. And I've done well. Mm -hmm. uh, have I exchanged it with something else often? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. We all do it. We all do it. It's the key of recognizing that we're doing it that makes you an entrepreneur. You know, it's actually there was a... There was a Texas A&M study uh, a number of years ago, the University of Texas A&M, that, uh, that looked at the uh, patterns of people, and they figured 500,000 years ago, humans built this gene. We, we built the gene in, in ourselves that, that makes us want to evolve in order to avoid dangers and avoid the situations it makes us evolve. That, that gene is the entrepreneur gene. And regardless of if we're black, white, yellow, if we're tall, short, fat, happy, whatever, if we're from big company, you know, from uh, big money, small money, if we're in projects or if we're in the castles, it doesn't matter. We all have it. It's the gene that drives us to thrive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
to go from surviving to thriving, to look for something better. We are all entrepreneurs, it's in our genes. Now, the, the question that you should ask is, when did you realize you're an entrepreneur? That was my next natural question. When was your first uh, realization that you were an entrepreneur? Uh, with the definition that I had, not, uh, not too long ago, maybe seven, eight years ago, after being an entrepreneur for years. For so many years, right? I didn't that. realize that I actually, uh, with this definition that I give you, Mm -hmm. And the quicker you realize you're an entrepreneur, the better. The better you are. So with that definition, wouldn't that make married people entrepreneurs? Because married they've taken people, married people or divorced people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, again, see, with that definition, a mother who was divorced, who has two kids, who goes mm -hmm. to work every day from six o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock at night and then saves her money to take their kids to have a better food or to go to Disneyland or to go. That woman is an entrepreneur. entrepreneur. She exchanges her time, her effort, her soundness, her health with something that in her mind is of higher value, the happiness of her kids. And she's navigating the risk of knowing that potentially it might not work out as well. Yeah. But she takes she, that she risks the not having meeting the right person in her life. She meets she she risks her own happiness. She risks her health of standing on her feet for fourteen hours a day, but she does it. Mm -hmm. She is an entrepreneur in my book, and a darn good one at that. And a darn good one at that. This is beautiful. I can see um, the philosopher, as we <laughs> put it, coming out in you. I wish more people would think about life the way you think about it. And the reason I say this is because as entrepreneurs, we wake up every morning with uncertainty. We wake up every morning knowing that things need to get done. Whatever it is needs to get done. And it depends on us, regardless of how we feel. But the problem a lot of times is that we focus too much on motivation and the feel good emotion to get going. And I think that's exacerbated because a lot of times we don't realize just how commendable it is what we're doing is like a lot of times for a lot of people, let's just use an example that everyone can relate to. You see a nice girl or a guy quite interested in that person, but it scares the living crap out of you to go over and say hi, to exchange numbers potentially and ask them out on that first date. But if you can realize just how much you've achieved in mustering up the courage to go over and introduce yourself, while navigating the risk of being rejected. Of course, it's going to hurt if you're rejected. But just to embrace that and acknowledge the growth that comes with it. Now, when you see the next person, you can learn from the previous um, encounter if it was a failure. And if it was a success, hats off to you, you can do the same thing all over again. And eventually, you won't have to be scared because you've grown so much. If we can magnify that growth that we all undergo when we navigate risk, when we try to be more than we are, when we diverge from what's normal and what we're used to and venture into the unknown, there's a lot of um, goodwill and happiness yes. to be gained from that, I think. So, you know, the thing is that people, people ask me if I'm a motivator, a motivational speaker. Or motiv I'm not a motivator because I don't believe I can motivate anybody. People motivate Motivation is part. within you to, yes. to have a motive. I can't give you a motive. I can only provoke you so that you can see the motive. Unless you realize that you're an entrepreneur, unless you realize that the exchange is all your choice, unless you realize that, hey, nothing would happen if I go and get a rejection from getting that, that phone call or getting that phone number or talking to somebody or doing something. Unless you realize that, the only one that can motivate us is ourselves. All I have to do in my opinion, and I do lots of podcasts and lots of articles. As I said, I write a lot of articles and so forth. And people ask me, why do you do that? But I have no benefit to gain out of talking to you, except provoking whoever, if one person from your audience says, ah, this guy is not full of it, he's got a point. If one person, I have exchanged, in my opinion, and practiced my entrepreneurship, I have exchanged what I have, which is an idea to provoke you with something better which I may not necessarily see mm -hmm. because I don't know who your audience are. I don't know where they are. But if I can provoke them 
to realize the power that they have within them, then it's worked for me. It's a, it's a good exchange. It's a good exchange. So I just want, you know, if you're looking for an outside influence to motivate you, it's very short-lived. You know, people yeah. listen to uh, motivational speakers uh, and somebody is, uh, you know, they don't have a leg. They've uh, conquered uh, unbelievable things. And yeah, in, in a way you admire that, but that's not you. You're not them. Tony Robbins. <laughs> you're not them. You, 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 you're you. So the motivation has to come within you, within the parameters of our lives, our limitations, each one of us. So all I can do is to provoke you and say, hey, my friend, you are an entrepreneur. You have everything that it takes. You have the ability to exchange your life, your time, your products, whatever, your ideas with something better. And I'll tell you something. You've always done it. You just don't realize it. The minute you realize you have that power, you realize that you have the power of choice. You realize that change is your friend, not your enemy. And then you're on your way. You don't need any. You don't need any bozo like me to motivate you to do anything. <laughs> you know what I want to ask you before before we wrap up? What would you say? I actually have two questions, mind you. I can tell you. You can only ask questions. one. I can only ask one. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Whatever you, you ask, I'm here. I'd have, have, have to measure, right? And I'm gonna ask the first question. <laughs> what would you say a meaningful, satisfactory life looks like or is? in your own definition, your own experience. So I can tell you what it is for me. I can't tell you what it is for you. I'm perfectly fine with that. Because you have your own choices and you have your own situations. I'm not you. Uh, for me, it's, uh, it's the ability or the opportunity to be creative, to build things. Uh, and building things means relationships. It means giving and taking love. Uh, uh, happiness is about my dog when she comes in and, and, and she licks all over me and that's uh, it's uh, it's the ability to not have expectations uh, I look at things as everything is a gift that's given to me because then I love everything I don't expect you to do anything for me and this is my wife says you know people say that but I really practice it it's and it's it's not easy it's it's hard uh, and I'm proud of having having that attitude because I think it helps me on a very selfish level. Because if I don't expect anything from anybody, whatever it gets to me, it's a gift. And yeah. I, I enjoy it 10 times more because it's a gift. I didn't expect it. You know, when they surprise you with a gift, you enjoy it a lot, a lot more than if you're sitting there and say, ah, this person should give me a gift and it should be worth this much or this much or this much. So... Happiness uh, and, 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 a, and a satisfactory life, I think it's about the exchanges that we, we give and take uh, in terms of love, in terms of creativity. Uh, of course, not having money uh, guarantees you a, a harder life. Yeah. You know? uh, but having money does not necessarily guarantee you a better life. Uh, sure. If you don't have money, of course, uh, it's hard to get health care. It's hard to get trans, you know, go places. It's hard to do a lot, a lot, a lot of things. It's hard to put food on the table and keep the It's hard out. to put food on the table. It's, it's hard. It's hard. Uh, but having it doesn't necessarily get... I have friends who, are, who have hundreds of millions of dollars in between us. I wouldn't, I wouldn't change my place with them. I wouldn't. Um, so it's very personal. It's very personal. Every one of us define that uh, in, our, in our own ways. I can agree with that. And I respect that. And in lieu, or in light of all of what you've shared, this year I'll be 30. I'm not yet 30. I'll be 30 in July, right? And um, in your position, your experience, and where you are in your life today, if you could give 30-year-old you just a bit of advice on how to move forward, what would that advice be? I'm going back to see what the 30-year-old me was doing. <laughs> I was 30 years <laughs> yeah. old. Um, I would have told him to read more. Really? I would have told him to listen more. There's a lot, a lot of every everybody that you see is giving you something. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at, at 30, I was uh, already a partner of a major consulting firm. I was sitting 
with the uh, in the boardrooms with the presidents of Union Bank and, and, and McDonnell Douglas and Hughes Helicopter and, and others. I was making good money and my ego was over the roof. Uh, uh, I would say control your ego. Yeah, ego is the enemy. I would say you're not all that. Mm. You're not all that. Uh, but again, uh, the, the listening thing I think is is, is is a key thing. I would listen. Everybody has a message for you. Mm -hmm. And can you internalize it? Are you listening or do you have your own filter? Uh, you know, I've been, uh, I've been thinking about this whole idea of listening for a while, for a while, for years. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I saw something the other day, uh, a quote, it says, we listen, uh, we don't listen to hear or learn. We listen to react. We're listening to, to kind of say what we think when, when, Listening should be for the, the act of learning, not the act of responding. Um, so I would listen more. That's what I would do. Listen more, read more. Ego is the enemy. I am going to take all of those advice to 30-year-old you to heart. I'm going to keep them close, but I'm going to act on them. I love whenever I come in contact with people who have lived longer than myself. They have a different viewpoint. They have experienced life in a different manner because those are the people I tend to learn the most from because they offer an alternate perspective that I of myself cannot think of. And I think that any advice from someone beyond my years is advice worth taking. There is this one saying that I love to keep in heart whenever I talk to older, younger people. Young men think old men to be fool. Old men know young men to be so. <laughs> and that keeps me humble, you know. So I thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you. It was a pleasure speaking with you. It was indeed a pleasure. How did you enjoy your time on the Boardroom Podcast today? I enjoyed it a lot. I, 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 I love you. talking to you. You are an open young man with uh, lots of hidden wisdom. Thank you. I look forward to having you on again. Hopefully we can have like a panel discussion where we can exchange thoughts among like-minded and sometimes deferred mind people like yourself and so on. I'm at your service. Thank you. Final question before you go. Given your experience on the Boardroom Podcast today, who is one guest that you would love to see on the podcast? For this guest, it doesn't have to be someone you know, but it could be someone you'd like to ask a question. What is one question that you would like us to ask them for you? Ask Elon Musk and see if he, he shares my definition of, <laughs> of, of entrepreneurship. Oh, definitely. That would be, that would be wonderful. To get his viewpoint on that. Thank you for your time, Sid. Have a Thank wonderful you. day. Take care. Bye-bye.